the way to think of this is you know any interstellar object entering the solar system you know we the the professional astronomers assume that it's uh, either an asteroid or a comet an asteroid is just a bare rock whereas um, a comet has some ice on it that gets evaporated when it comes close to the sun and and that's why you see a cometary tail around the comet uh but any object moving through interstellar space would accumulate uh, ices um, because it's it's freezing out there and and so when it comes close to the sun you would see some evaporation that's what people don't realize that the existence of some gas around it you know from ices that were on the surface is just telling you what's on the skin of the object uh, and as we all know you know you can't judge a book by its cover so uh, if you just see what lies on the skin of the object it doesn't tell you that it's necessarily natural and in this case you know we saw co2 uh, carbon dioxide mostly but we also saw nickel without iron and uh cyanide and uh you know it looks uh, a little unusual i mean these things are not uh, often seen in 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 the comets that uh, we we know about and also the light from it had a very unusual negative polarization i'm just saying let's keep our minds open uh because once we argue um you know dogmatically that it any object in the sky that has some cloud of gas around it must be a comet you know we lose the opportunity to learn something new and you know that was the biggest mistake of the of the vatican you know when galileo said i'm looking through my telescope i see mo moons moving around jupiter and therefore not everything revolves around the earth that was his conclusion you know the vatican said no we will put you in house arrest we don't want you know today he would have been cancelled on social media we don't want you to be heard basically that's what they told him uh and uh, then 350 years later they admitted that uh, he was right that was in 1992 and to me it, it looks like a very embarrassing uh, public relations uh, act on on the side of the vatican because you know they should have said you know we have more money than you do we will be the build a bigger and better telescope and uh, show that you're wrong and then they would have found that he's right uh, and 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 save themselves uh, from from this embarrassment. Yeah, I want to clarify there. So the Vatican, the the Catholic Church, didn't admit that Galileo was right until 1992. Yes, it blows my mind that it took until the the late 20th century for uh, an institution like the Catholic Church to admit that Galileo was right. And maybe maybe some of these issues that you run into with the larger scientific community these days are maybe not so surprising. We're just seeing human patterns here that don't want to admit well, change you or know, the possibility I'm, I'm, of change. Uh, I feel much more fortunate than Galileo because. Uh, you know, aside from what happened during the pandemic that I had to stay at home, nobody put me, puts me in house arrest. Uh, but I do feel that there is this resistance uh, for uh, being open-minded uh, about some questions. And, you know, the, the common denominator is that uh, the church wanted the humans to be at the center of the universe because uh, that was serving its politics to, to tell people that, they, you know, they're important and God looks at uh, what they're doing and um and so uh, you know uh, they didn't want uh, the alternative to be right and 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 uh, now the the question of whether we are uh at the intellectual center of the universe uh, you know is also being threatened if if there is a smarter kid on the block we are not the smartest that ever existed and and i can understand where it's coming from because i watched my two daughters when they were infants and when they were at home and they the only data set they had was what they see around them they thought that they're at the center of the universe because we paid a lot of attention to them but um, they started uh, uh, noticing that there are other houses on the street uh, but uh, as they grew a bit older and, and could look through the windows and and that's where we are right now we see a lot of earth sun uh, analogs in our cosmic street uh, but they never had the, uh, an idea that uh, there might be other kids like them in those houses until they went on the first day to the kindergarten. And then, of course, they had a shock, psychological shock, and they matured very quickly because they saw some kids that are smarter than them. And I think uh, we are still at, at, at the phase that we are not mature yet. Uh, we, we still doubt 
that uh, there are residents in the houses on the street that we see. These are Earth Sun systems. So, so the astronomy community is willing to invest uh, more than ten billion dollars in searching for microbes in these houses, which is very challenging, you know, from the vantage point of your home to look through the windows and and figure out if there are microbes in other houses. And I'm just saying, look, even if there is only one resident, uh, you know, there might be a tennis ball in our backyard that this uh, resident uh, threw away, you know, and or um, that resident might show up in uh, uh, at our front door one day, or or you might see from a distance a, a construction project in the backyard of that resident, and all of these might be much easier to detect than uh, microbes. So I think we should hedge our bets and just uh, put billions of dollars to the search for intelligence, not just to the search for microbes. Because frankly, if we find intelligence, it will have a bigger impact on our future. Uh, we can learn from them, uh, new science, new technology. Uh, I find uh, intelligence far more inspiring than microbes. Yeah, and you know, you've talked before about sort of the allocation. There's only so many dollars to go around for scientific research, right? And right. Uh, you've talked before about whether it's microbes or looking at other dimensions or dark matter or things that there's not really any solid scientific proof that what you're looking for even exists, um, much like, uh, you know, uh, extraterrestrial interplanet or uh, extraterrestrial intelligent life. Um, you know, one thing that I was thinking about is I think that there actually is, it's very possible that there's a connection between if we're searching for other dimensions, that we're also searching for intelligent life. Because I think the first, if and when we do come across extraterrestrial intelligent life, the next question after like, okay, it exists is well, where did they come from? And there's no guarantee if we can't as far out as we can look, we can look almost to the edges of the universe right now, as far as like what light has been able to reach us so far we we can see pretty far and if we haven't found it yet um it doesn't mean it doesn't exist but it's just we haven't seen it yet and so it would be prudent to not rule out that if we do find life outside this planet that it may not be from this dimension so do you think that the two theoretical possibilities are maybe in some ways could be linked well you see the the science that we are using to search for uh, intelligence. And by the way, it's not uh, a high priority. As I mentioned, the highest priority is to search for microbes within mm -hmm. the mainstream of... So if you are not uh, investing money or time in the search, you will not find anything. Uh, and, uh, you know, when people say extraordinary uh, claims require extraordinary evidence, I say extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. So mm -hmm. without putting the money and the resources, you know, we are unlikely to find it. And, uh, you know, it's a circular argument to say we don't have evidence as of yet when we don't make it a priority. Uh, but um, uh, in the way we search, uh, you know, obviously we are biased by uh, only one century of modern science. Uh, you know, quantum mechanics was discovered exactly 100 years ago. And um, I was actually at the Niels Bohr Institute uh, where it was uh, discovered uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, I was in the auditorium where uh, Niels Bohr was sitting next to uh, Werner Heisenberg, uh, next to Lev Landau, Wolfgang Pauli. So when I sat on the bench, the wooden bench, uh, they told me, oh, you're just sitting where Wolfgang Pauli sat. And I felt honored. But the only thing I could think of is how uncomfortable this bench is. It was just wood. <laughs> they had really low quality of life back then, 100 years ago. But nevertheless, it was inspiring. And I wish I was there 95 years ago when they discovered the foundations of, um, of quantum mechanics because uh, they were open-minded. Back then, uh, you know, there were no people that would ridicule by making some uh, blog post or by making some um, uh, video on YouTube, uh, ridicule ideas about the reality that we are not aware of because quantum mechanics was telling us that um, the physical reality is very different from what our intuition says. It's, you know, it, it's probabilistic. Uh, an electron can be in, in multiple places at the same time, which sounds counterintuitive. And, and uh, uh, when you find it in one place, it immediately eliminates uh, what happens at another place uh, even faster than light. You know, th this is the concept of entanglement. And, 
And so these ideas, I'm sure, would have been ridiculed on social media if they were. Uh, but the point is that you have to be open-minded. You have to discuss possibilities because our imagination is not as as great as as nature, you know. And and so here is an example where we didn't imagine quantum physics, and it, it happens to be the most fundamental uh, description of reality. Okay, as far as we know as of now, but you are completely correct that we may have a very uh, a partial view of reality because, and I'm not talking necessarily about extra dimensions, but uh, we don't know what most of the matter in the universe is, we call it dark matter. We don't know what most of the energy is, we call it dark energy. We don't know how to unify quantum mechanics and gravity. And it may well be that advanced civilizations are using all of this knowledge in ways that we cannot detect. Because we cannot detect dark matter, we just see that it it affect its effect through gravity, and the same with dark energy. And just imagine that are using dark matter as fuel. Okay, you won't be able to see it. It's the best stealth engine. <laughs> you you can't see anything coming from the exhaust because it's dark matter. Or if they use quantum gravity for propulsion, you know these are concepts that we have no idea about. Uh, so. You don't need to think necessarily about extra dimensions to realize that, you know, the way we search for them might be too limited and we are missing them. But um, another thing to keep in mind is I once calculated, suppose there is a nuclear war on a planet, you know, can we detect uh, the explosions if we look at it at the right time? And the answer is no, even if you had a global uh, world war that is completely nuclear, it, we won't be able to detect it by orders of magnitude from the nearest star. The nearest, uh, uh, you know, Alpha Centauri system uh, is not close enough uh, by orders of magnitude. And with our very best telescopes, we won't be able to detect the flare that comes from a global nuclear war on, on a habitable planet like, uh, for example, Proxima Centauri B, which is the nearest to the solar system. So, you know, even our telescopes right now, you know, require uh, huge amounts of um, uh, uh, power uh, from the whoever um, uh, creates a technological signature uh, for us to be able to see it at a large distance. And uh, that is another factor we need to take into account that maybe, you know, uh, they are quite uh, subtle and the effects they make is, is are not easy to detect. You know, there is also this idea that uh, those that were visible and easily visible were already destroyed or killed or, or captured because um, it's just like a dark forest where you are predators and and uh, so if you want to survive you better not make a sound and unfortunately humanity was not careful enough you know for a hundred years we transmitted radio signals so so they may show up at our front door you know these predators one day and that's my worry about the three i atlas yeah at the the way I've always liked to think about it is we didn't know UV rays, ultraviolet rays existed for a long time. They existed. We just couldn't see them. Exactly. And, and also infrared. Infrared is more important because, mm -hmm. as you know, in the military, uh, if you put the goggles, uh, you can see humans or tanks that are not visible to the human eye because uh, they don't emit uh, visible light uh, at night, but um, uh, instead they emit uh, heat, uh, infrared radiation which was discovered by an astronomer. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, infrared light is not something that our eyes are sensitive to. And um, by the way, the, the astronomer that discovered it is uh, Herschel, who also was uh, a musician, a composer. He has uh, wow. beautiful uh, uh, musical pieces that uh, one, you know, I, I highly recommend. I, I didn't know that he made music. I, I know him as a scientist. I, I recognize the name at least, but I didn't know he made music as yeah. well. And he uh, discovered infrared radiation that was not known before him. So mm -hmm. because if you think about it, the human eye was, uh, you know, evolved, developed to be sensitive to sunlight. Mm -hmm. And um, that's important for survival, you know, because the, the sunlight is reflected from uh, predators, from uh, objects and in order to survive in an environment that is illuminated by sunlight, you need sensitivity to that light. But uh, the infrared radiation is not as uh, essential uh, uh, for that. And um, uh, if we were to live, for example, near a dwarf star like Proxima Centauri that emits only infrared, 
then I'm sure we would have uh, infrared eyes, uh, which, you know, there are animals that have uh, infrared eyes, um, uh, like the mantis uh, shrimp, for example. It's sensitive. Really? Yeah. Um, and so, and if we were to live near a neutron star that emits X-rays, then we might have had X-ray sensors, you know, like you find in the airport. Um, so uh, the kind of animals you have uh, near different uh, sources of light uh, would have different sensors, you know, and, and they would usually reflect the, the type of light emitted by the host star uh, because that's useful for survival. Yeah, I've th I've actually thought about that a lot. I'm um, I've always wondered, you know, some of the very rural regions of Afghanistan that I went into uh, while I was still in the military, and thinking about some of those folks that had no idea that we could see in the dark, they could not, or at least not any more than uh, the the moon allowed on any given night, which sometimes is actually really good to the point where we wouldn't use night vision. But then also the fact that, yeah, we had used infrared lasers on our rifles. We had infrared lasers, large ones coming down from the sky to illuminate what building, what person people were around, like, and just to the person that wasn't looking through the lens of a, of a night vision device would have no idea that any of this stuff is around. Well, just and, think about the, the Iranian defense system when the B-2 bombers showed overhead. Mm -hmm. They had no clue as to what uh, how, what to do about it. And um, so, you know, and this, we are talking here about a gap in uh, technological abilities of only several decades. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but think about a million years or a billion years difference between us and, and another civilization in that case.